feel free to ask questions for our speakers. And uh, tap in any questions to that window, and I will uh, moderate that question and uh, ask for our speakers. So our first speaker is Erin, uh, the Director of Special Analysis and Research Center from UCMSAT. And she will be speaking on monitoring special data species on Merced Vernal Coast Grassland Reserve. So let's welcome Erin. So I will leave well, some to Erin. Thank you. I am going to screen, uh, share my screen. I'm gonna do something new and fun. Might take a little bit to upload. But I tested this already. Okay, can you see me okay? And my slide. Looks great. Thank you okay. for doing that. That's the new Zoom trick, I love it. That's the new Zoom trick, yeah. Thanks for, um, to our Chair Albert. So, um, so yeah, my, my talk's going to probably be 12 minutes. I'll, I'll try to, I have my, I'm going to set my timer because I, I could talk for a while. Um, but what I'm going to go into today um, with everyone is the work that um, I've been able to do monitoring the special sp status species on the Merced Vernal Pool Grasslands Reserve, which is a part of the um, University of California Natural Reserve System. So for those who may not be aware, the University of California has an array of um, natural reserves that are utilized for um, research purposes uh, mostly. But our, our reserve has, a diff has some unique um, qualities to it and some challenges, so I'll get into that. Um, this isn't an overly technical question, but I can, I'm happy to go into a lot of the technical aspects. I'm just going into basically a use case and some things that we learned along the way and um, kind of why I'm involved. So as I said before, um, or as, as, as Yuan mentioned, um, I am the director of the Spatial Analysis and Research Center, uh, but I have a pretty interesting um, GIS GPS background. Um, what you see up to the, I gotta do the other side, that side. Do um, you see the golf robot? My first job in 1997 was mapping um, golf courses for what they called uh, a robotic golf caddy. It was a personal autonomous robotic golf caddy. So that little mast on top of the, um, the caddy that you see here is a GPS antenna. So I worked in during a time when we had, it's called selective availability. I was going to do a fun poll and, and ask people if they knew what that was. Because when I tell students um, ask them, they're like, what is selective availability? Well, before 2000, they would scramble the GPS single. Um, and this was like a national security, homeland security thing that the US government put in place. So I worked with Stanford and Berkeley engineers mostly on this project in the Silicon Valley. Um, I am a Humboldt State grad. I am not from the UC uh, alumni. So I just wanted to uh, clarify that my, my um, degree is in resource planning and I am um, focused on GIS, which was great. Um, and I was able to get this really cool job and uh, I, can, I, can, I can say that I was attacked by a robot. Um, this robot actually drove up the tree and flipped upside down. And at the time we were $7 million in venture capital and we had seven robots. So we called them the $1 million robots. And, Back in 97, that was a lot of money. Um, and so I tried to save the robot from driving up the tree, which ended up pinning my leg. And um, anyway, it was, it was interesting. So if, if you're looking at GIS careers and what you can do, like I just put myself out there and got myself into this, this startup company and it was a lot of fun. But then I moved on in 98 to a firm in Sonora and that's where I live now. Sonora, California is in the Sierra foothills. And we worked on a product called PenMap. And PenMap was this very complicated data collection system that integrated with laser range finders, total stations. It was built, um, the, the developers were from um, the UK, but their clients were, were Swiss or the, um, so a lot of accuracy, you know, respect for accuracy and data accuracy. So 
try, just think of training these type of data collection systems, pre-internet, pre-mobile phones, the computers we were using were $10,000. The software was really difficult to, to use. And um, so I worked in that arena from about 1998 to maybe 2004 or so. And then to the right um, is a screenshot of Arc Mat, ArcPad, it should be ArcPad. So ArcPad was an older data collection system that kind of took over and, and, and it was the, the jumpstart into Esri's data collection. So that's, again, my career really started in data collection and figuring out how to bring data out from the field into a GIS. So I felt like when this project presented itself that I would be a good person to help make this work. So on to the next slide. Oh, I guess I was, um, okay. on to the next slide. So the overview of the Vernal Pools Grassland Reserve. So the um, reserve is adjacent to the UC Merced campus. And initially it was actually um, going to be the site of the UC Merced campus. And I don't wanna go into any political environmental you know, uh, mid you know, litigation stuff that happened, but they, the campus built, the, the land was donated to the university. So there was other places they were looking like Modesto. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with California geography, Merced is in what we call the heart of California. It's the, the Central Valley, the San Joaquin Valley. It is where we grow our food and um, it's, it's a fantastic area, but really underserved as far as um, having a research university. So that's why they picked this area and because the land was donated. So they had to reconfigure their plans and they actually built the campus on top of a um, old golf course. And they agreed that they would mitigate and protect these um, special species that they were gonna build the campus on un unintentionally as part of the mitigation. So. Um, again, the mission of our university is to establish a world-class university in the San Joaquin County. And um, we, reserve, we manage this reserve ecosystem to protect rare and endangered species um, and, to, and, to, and to investigate ecological research questions. And research isn't just local. We have national researchers that come to the site and, um, and study all sorts of great things. So when you're dealing with the tremendous amount of research and when you're dealing with um, really varying uses, administrative mitigation and research, um, and we also had our service learning team, our engineering service learning team doing lots of projects out there. We have a very strong um, service learning component to our university, which again is amazing because they, they come up with some great projects and some come up in mapping and GIS in addition to engineering. So to the left is the picture of the um, um, I was reading the chat. I was like, I got to focus on the presentation. Um, is the camp outline to the left is the reserve. So this is a 6,500 acre reserve and the wetlands and the trails um, that are part of that. And then below to the um, Southwest is the campus. So again, my office, um, which will, is going to be moved, but my office has a view of basically all of these lands. And I, I like to tell people on a clear day, just to put geographic into perspective here, on a clear day, which is rare, I can see Half Dome and El Capitan um, from my building. So um, I can see Yosemite National Park from my building, which is I would say 50, 60 miles away. So uh, we're, we're in a really pretty location if, if you're wondering about Merced. Um, so again, these reserve lands are environmental mitigation lands subject to federal and state permits. And I am going over time really quickly. So we have, um, we established an ArcGIS online group for data sharing. Mm -hmm. And this enables us to kind of promote our authoritative data sets for everybody instead of having this, hey, can I have the shape file for this or shape file for that? We have now a group that we invite people to. And so they have access to data sets. And whenever we update data sets, we put them um, 
on the um, on the portal. And then our plans is, are to create an ArcGIS hub. Future plans to create an ArcGIS hub. So um, with that hub, again, it'll be um, a, a nice place to have centralized data. That, it's just really important. Data was all over the place. We didn't know what was what. We had duplicate sets. Um, and then with, with the non-research elements, we have a lot of mitigation requirements. So these are a list of some of the special, special, special status species that need to be monitored for mitigation purposes for the construction of the campus and for expansion. So we can have our campus here, but we need to make sure we take care of these um, environmentally sensitive areas. And how do we do that? We are doing that with GIS and we're doing that with data collection. And we are looking at different um, species like the California tiger salamander, succulent owl's clover, which I will get into more, fairy shrimp, kit, fo kit, fo kit fox habitat. And I have a link for more information. And so the succulent owl clover is the focus of our data collection project. The initial data was collected in 1999, which uh, from a consultant. And so that was a long time ago um, in the grand scheme of things. And the consultants that we hired or they hired would perform yearly monitoring. Again, the, the campus wasn't constructed until 2005. So there weren't, we didn't have staff um, that worked at UC Merced to actually do this. But um, coming around 2017, when we hired a, a campus biologist instead of a consultant, she decided that it would be best and more efficient for her to start monitoring the succulent owls clovers, which are very tiny flowers, um, as you can see by the picture. Um, and then when I looked at her data and she brought it to me, she goes, oh, I'll use this third party app and a Garmin. So I implemented ArcGIS Collector, which we did, we used in 2018, 19, and 20. And this is an example of the results of one of our surveys. So I you know, use our, our published map and zoomed in for the legend so you can see a little clearly. Of, of what we surveyed. Did we find succulent owl clover? Did we find new locations? Did we go to locations that weren't that didn't exist? Now I, I can't get into the details of the species per se, but um, because I'm not a biologist, but in rainy years, we do observe a lot more of these species. And there have been years during the drought seasons that we haven't seen any. And the timing of the data collection is very specific. We have a window of about two weeks to actually um, to go out and, and watch the bloom and people have to go, hey, they're blooming. So we go out there and survey. And so there were a lot of benefits for using Collector. We didn't need additional equipment. Uh, the data automatically uploaded to ArcGIS online. We had multiple editors at one time and we can include photo attachments. So if you, we visited the site and, which used to have uh, that species and we take a picture the next year and they're not there. Well, okay, what were the conditions? Um, one interesting side note, we noticed that um, a lot of these species thrived with grazing. So when these vernal pools were grazed upon that these, um, uh, these special species actually flourished. Um, and we were able to integrate with higher accuracy GPS systems. So instead of using the Garmin handheld and maybe a notepad or trying to connect the two, uh, we had some submeter GPS um, that we were able to use. And there, there really was a minimal learning curve. So um, handing it off to someone with not much training, as long as the forms were built correctly, and those are the things I'll get into a little bit, um, there wasn't too much learning curve. It was like, get out there, collect the data, but you got to plan and you got to know what your schema is, which is the challenges of using Collector. So this is the three of us. Um, out there um, in March of 2020. It was a beautiful day and I'll get into more of that day on the next slide. But um, it, at first it didn't always support offline editing. We weren't always sure if the database was updated when we were collecting in the field. Some points were accidentally moved and that was really what we wanted to prevent. We were, we were surveying existing points. We didn't wanna move points on accident. And then it was kind of hard to, to track multiple editors. So. That day of March 17th, 2020, um, if anyone's familiar with, I don't know if you know about the pandemic, but um, that, was, that was my last day I was allowed on campus. And so 
I wanted to take opportunity. Well, I couldn't really interface in meetings. So I got to ride an ATV. I got to do a selfie with a cow. Um, and I went out and um, quickly updated the schema and the form. I removed duplicate points from 1999. We discovered there was some errors there. So our reporting was over-reported because we had duplicate points. Um, it was my first opportunity to test the application. So I was actually excited to be out there. Again, it was a glorious day. It was my last day on campus, which was sad, but it was just, um, I don't know. I just, I, I just have really fond feelings of being able to ride an TV and collect GIS data uh, as part of my job. I thought that was just, an, just a great thing. And we did test the multiple editors. The things we need to do in the future is maybe normalize our GPS positions. Um, we, again, I was able to get on-site field feedback from the campus biologist and the reserve director in the field. So before I, would, I could see the biologist out in the field on ArcGIS Online and I was able to see her real-time edits, which was a little scary, not scary, it was accidental that I had her map open, but it was, you know, there was a little bit of quality control or maybe security that I wanna make sure that you know, not that what I can see wouldn't be something public, which it wasn't, but it was just like, pretty impressive that I was able to see her in real time and how she um, navigated the reserve. And yeah, we got to hang out with cows that day and that was a lot of fun. And so when I talk about schema, it's how the database is organized. So we would collect certain, um, certain um, variables about the succulent owl clover, like how many there were, um, the date of, collection, who was collecting the data. We also set up a coding system so we can make sure that we knew. So the schema is like the, your database header. And so schema changes can get challenging over time. If you keep changing the schema, you don't have a consistent database over um, a, a span of time. So you have to make sure, you really wanna make sure that's solid, but in reality with GIS, GPS data collection, you have to expect schema changes. And so lessons learned moving forward. This is a barn that no longer exists. It sadly was destroyed in a windstorm last year, um, but I wanted to pay homage to it. So how do we eliminate errors? Um, do we fix the accuracy of the points from 99? How do we figure out who's collecting data? How do we retrieve the photos easier? You can do it in pro and in collector, but there's some challenges with that. How do we validate new points versus existing surveys? So we may think we collected a new point, but it might have been an existing survey that got maybe moved. And then identify additional surveys and species that would benefit from this approach. So we're gonna, we took on this, which was a little more challenging, but maybe what other things can we use collector for in the field? And so as far as um, I just wanna acknowledge with the cows, again, I had such a great time with the cows. Um, I want to acknowledge the efforts from Francesca Canzino, the campus biologist at UC Merced, um, with the new construction of our university, which I didn't showcase because of time. Uh, she really had her hands full with um, birds nesting in cranes, with um, just all sorts of just crazy um, environmental issues with the construction of basically we doubled the size of our campus in three years and that's pretty significant and I also want to acknowledge Joy Vassetti who is the new reserve director um, she's been making some great ma maps and managing some, some of the GIS data which I appreciate and she manages the reserve so she's on the research side Francesca's on the administrative side I work for the university library so um, I kind of just bridging everybody together so um, I see that there are some, some questions and yep. trying not to get out into time. So yes, Jiwon. Yes, so uh, I'll finish. Actually, may I add one question from the, the chat that didn't make it over into q and It was, um, what did you mean by schema, please? Yes, I think I tried to quickly to explain what a schema is as far as um, your database structure. So when you're when you're working in GIS, your the construction of your um, attributes 
and your definition of your attributes is your your schema. So you, you have you could have in this case our variables were date, our variables were the number of species, um, uh, our variable we add, we added the ability to attach photos. So in our schema, like if you think of the header of a spreadsheet, that's the top header is your schema, and then you need to define your schema. Is it a text field? Is it a date field? Is it um, is it a Boolean, you know, all these different factors that come into play when you're out in the field collecting data because you don't want to collect numeric data and it being stored as a text field because then you can't do your analysis. Um, so then um, the yeah, so grazing, another... okay, yeah. I'm sorry. We have another oh, no, I... question in the question and answer window. Uh, so the first one is, you said green had a positive impact on the species. And uh, so you, you you saw that question, right? Can you answer that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, so the as, first one, since the cows is, are non-native. Yes, the cows are non-native. So that's that's kind of like how you just assume that okay, the cows are destructive, right? Or, but they actually their their grazing actually manages the grassland from overgrowing and overtaking other species. So is there talk of using the space as a potential site for rewilding or native grazers? At this time, probably not because this reserve is surrounded by grazing land. So they basically, they'll take the set of cows and they have one plot and then they'll move them to another. So we're kind of in a, we're in a network of grazed area. Um, and so the question of, cows are good or bad um, that's not I guess something I'm qualified to do but from what you know it's, it's kind of an accepted like yeah this works this is an ecosystem that functions this is an ecosystem that even though a non-native species is supporting special status species it seems to be a, a management practice and so how do you manage that with um, non-native graders grazers I'm not sure but that's a really good question and then the last question. Uh, yes, so I, I think we have limited time. Uh, I'm okay. wondering if Aaron can tap answering the question and answer window. So I sure. want to move to the next speaker. So thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So the, our next speaker is Joseph from uh, Planet and he's a director of the academic program. And Planet is an aerospace company. Wow. Aerospace. So we will talk about a planet uh, CubeSat constellation and its applications in Earth science. So let's welcome Joseph. Thanks. I'm grateful to be here. Just to confirm, can you see my slides? Okay. So uh, yes, Planet is an aerospace yeah. company, and I'm not sure how well this will play through the Zoom, but I'm just going to show you an animation. We're actually the largest operator of Earth observation satellites in space right now. We have about 120 spacecraft on orbit around the Earth. Most of these are small CubeSats, which you see there, which orbit the Earth in a sun-synchronous orbit, similar to Landsat and Sentinel. And these collect data that brings us nearly to daily revisit capability around the planet. Um, we also operate high-resolution tasking satellites. These are called SkySats, and they're, some of them are shown here on a different orbit. This helps us visit multiple targets per day. Um, that is to say, we can image in high resolution at the same target multiple times per day, usually up to 10 times, depending on the location. Um, we're collecting an enormous amount of data. Just to put it in context, um, Planet has already collected more data on a per square kilometer basis just in the last three years than the entire Landsat program back to the early 1970s. So we're collecting around 300 million square kilometers of data per day. Uh, again, largest satellite operator. Most of those are uh, have deorbited. We've been upgrading them in space. This is a sampling of what our imagery looks like. We image right now in four spectral channels, red, green, and blue, and near infrared. We're also in the process of bringing on additional spectral channels over the next uh, six to 12 months. And I'll show you how we're going to do that. And this is actually a preview of one of our five band images, which are just uh, about to be in production. 
For the remote sensing uh, savvy in the audience, just a quick look at the spectral capabilities of these sensors. So we call these Dove CubeSats. We also call them PlanetScope. That's the payload on board the satellite. So our oldest spacecraft, the one in the top row, used a Bayer mask, which is sort of cell phone type technology, basically, but we were imaging in red, green, and blue and near infrared. But as you see in the middle row and the third row, we've begun to improve the spectral radiometric properties of this data, uh, these data, I should say, with a scientific audience. Um, we're, what we're doing with these uh, radiometric observations is bringing them more into coherence with Sentinel-2. So if you look and follow the blue channels, the green channel, red channel, near infrared channel, you see that they're nearly overlapping with Sentinel-2, which should make the practice of using our data easier with Sentinel-2 or, or Landsat-8 data, which is relatively consistent with Sentinel-2. The resource I very much want to call your attention to today is our education and research program, and I'm quite grateful for the UC system in, in terms of having me today. Um, I'm also happy to see Elia on the phone because we were just on the phone yesterday um, talking about this program. We have three tiers in our education and research program, which is a university program. It's global in nature. We take individual applications for the basic tier of this program, which is a freemium tier. Um, it is by application only, so you have to teach us a little bit about what you're doing. And you can find uh, application information at go.planet.com research. We have around 5,000 users in the program at more than 1,000 different universities worldwide, including many students and faculty within the UC system. And what are users using this data for? Well, anything that you might use remote sensing data for, ecology, uh, structural deformation of the Earth's surface. We have hydrologists, cryosphere scientists. I myself am a tropical ecologist and a remote sensing scientist, so I'm partial to some of the early biodiversity work. People are experimenting with species detections based on the timing of flowering and phenology and other things. Um, you can also find some sampling. Google Scholar works too, but at planet.com slash pulse slash publications over here, you can find some examples of recent papers that people have published with our data. In addition to those basic licenses, we also offer a site license. It's very similar to the Esri Geospatial University site license. And we are working with about 50 universities worldwide, uh, including several of the UC schools. Um, but but you know, just down the street, Stanford, and then next door, Arizona State, hold campus licenses, as does the University of Copenhagen and Technical University in Munich and MIT. Um, and now for the remainder of my time, I just wanna give you a, a, a real brief sampling of, of some recent studies um, that touch on all different elements of the earth system. The first, of course, uh, obviously we're all heavily affected by this pandemic and scientists, I should rephrase, science itself is no exception. So we've had several requests of people who are looking to study the effects of lockdowns on our earth system. Um, one of the more interesting, which was published a couple of months ago, looks at the effects of marine traffic lockdown in Venice on sedimentation within the harbor around Venice. And they detected a very strong signal of improved water clarity in the early weeks of the lockdown. And this is work um, out of the University of Trento in Italy. Uh, at the University of Cyprus, a recent paper from a group used phenology, vegetation phenology, and changes in soil moisture the daily revisit capability of the Dove CubeSats, imaging every single day, allows a totally unique time series analysis from a remote sensing perspective. And in this particular case, these authors were looking for subtle changes in soil moisture and vegetation that are reminiscent of agricultural features, excuse me, archeological features at this particular site in Romania. You can see this, um, this center structure here, which is basically, it's a, it's a almost thousand year old uh, soil compaction difference that's still visible now from space. Um, and a, a little bit more recent even than that, um, there's a group at the tech national, you know, sorry, the National uh, Technical University of Athens that has been looking at marine plastics, which I think has been on everybody's mind. Here too, the daily frequency of the doves in the nearshore environment means that very uh, normally rare events like outflow from storms upstream, um, because of the higher frequency of imaging observations, we can see debris and other material carried out of effluent basically into the ocean. And this Greek team um, put together a study on this. 
Now, those were just a smattering. I did wanna also give you more of a discipline by discipline picture of what people are working on. I'm gonna show you just five more slides that provide some additional insight in what kinds of things people are publishing and studying in the classroom with planet imagery. And I'm gonna spend the most, most time on this one slide because it concerns remote sensing itself. Um, with passive optical sensors, I mean, we've all, for the last 10 years, especially the last five years, I think in the, in the earth science world, been working with Landsat and Sentinel-2 data as the primary passive optical space-based remote sensing assets. Okay. okay, these data are public, they're free, they're easy to access, they're in Earth Engine, they're on AWS. Authors using Planet's education and research program, um, and from here on this slide, three different universities, one in Belgium, University of Illinois, uh, the Big Ten School, and then University of Hong Kong, are all using planet data in combination with some of these sensors. So Sentinel-2, Landsat, also MODIS, which is daily uh, a NASA satellite, a NASA sensor, I should say, but, but coarse resolution, 250 meters per pixel. They're using the 3.7 meter pixel resolution of planets doves and the daily frequency of planets observations to produce synthetic fused time series data that allow you to uniquely look into the phenology of ecosystems. So on the bottom right, this is a study from the University of Hong Kong. And here they're looking at the phenology of tropical trees in the Amazon. This is at a site near Manaus. And what this lab has been looking at is, can they use the time series of canopies to do species level classifications of these different canopies, even though they're just working with multispectral data? Um, and so far they've made a fair bit of progress. In a, even more recent paper, they're also using the same method to look at autumn fall color changes in temperate forest canopies. Um, in this case in China, but this method would be applicable to temperate forests and, and even potentially savannas in the US. Um, and then in the bottom left, an enormous amount of agricultural research has taken place. And this is work out of Caillou Guan's lab at the University of Illinois. It's very sophisticated work. Caillou and team are fusing dove imagery with MODIS imagery and other assets to create daily three meter resolution time series of leaf area index and other kind of advanced agricultural or ecosystem level parameters. This is quite compelling work because LAI traditionally when you do this with remote sensing, it does depend to a degree on SWIR data on shortwave infrared. Planet does not image in the shortwave infrared yet. However, uh, Caillou is able to basically get the high frequency, high spatial resolution benefit of dove imagery, but the additional spectral depth of MODIS, put these two together and get a very dense, very high resolution time series to understand how these agricultural systems are changing. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through every other remaining paper here, but just to give you another sampling around the earth system, people are studying the geosphere, including through surface deformation. Um, we've had a group at Caltech, which is shown here using dove imagery to look at the Ridgecrest earthquake that happened in California in 2019. Um, also going into surface deformation related to hydrological systems and glacier systems. Uh, in the hydrosphere itself, in the bottom right, and this is one of my favorite papers that I was able actually to collaborate on, a group used intra-daily observations from the Dove CubeSat. So sometimes, because of orbital mechanics, we'll get an image separated from another image by only 90 or 60 seconds. And in this case, they tracked the surface feature sort of uh, flow of the surface of a stream which had ice debris in it um, using optical flow methods. A few atmospheric studies, our system is not exactly designed specifically to image the atmosphere. However, we do detect haze and of course we detect clouds like any other passive optical sensor. So some users have been looking at the changes in air pollution caused by the pandemic in certain uh, environments. This is work from Duke University, in this case leveraging convolutional neural nets to look at atmosphere just based on the visible occlusion of the pixels, um, but still again leveraging that high frequency observation. There's been some interesting cloud masking studies. In the cryosphere, where probably the majority of the literature with our imagery has been published, um, permafrost, hydrological systems, glacier calving rates, glacial retreats, um, we've had a number of very sophisticated cryosphere studies, including analyzing, in one case, more than 100,000 uh, high latitude lakes. That's work by Sarah Cooley, uh, who's now a professor at Oregon State University. And finally, and, and as a tropical ecologist, perhaps where my own interests are the greatest, um, 
the way we can look at vegetation with this system in general is really unprecedented. I want to stress, and I think Elia is already getting started doing this with Planet Data at UC Riverside, um, the high frequency observations combined with the high spatial resolution mean, for example, individual large trees are normally resolved with this system. So the pixels are sharp enough that you see a single tree canopy, or, sorry, a single tree crown in say a tropical forest or a temperate forest. They're a little bit harder to differentiate in boreal forests where the crowns are narrower. Um, but the physical structure of the forest is therefore visible by this system. And for the most part, that's not true in Sentinel-2 and it's definitely not true in Landsat where the pixel is a 30 meter. So we've had a number of authors, including this work um, from Greg Asner's lab at Arizona State, where we've fused LIDAR data or other structural active sensor data with this passive optical planet data in order to make high resolution, high frequency maps of carbon stocks, carbon fluxes, other vegetation structural characteristics. People are similarly using this method to look into wildfire, especially high frequency uh, wildfires that occur in the, in the boreal regions and some of the savannas of the world. And in the bottom right, um, a recent paper used uh, some of the, the UN sustainable development goals on land use and land cover change, particularly urban growth and green spaces in urban growth basically use the high frequency observations from planet to understand how, uh, whether a city was able to get to meet its sustainable development goal targets uh, with the United Nations. So that kind of ends the whirlwind uh, earth systems tour, but I'm gonna put up this application website one more time, and then also refer you to this publications page. Not every paper is up here. We, we publish, uh, you know, blogs on a handful of the very interesting papers, but also Google Scholar searching for Planet Labs, Planet Scope, which is the name of our payload, um, or Planet Satellites uh, will also help you find some other studies. And so uh, why don't I stop there and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation, Joe. Uh, and uh, it seems that Planet provides a great data resource for scientific community. And it's very good to know the information from you. So we have uh, basically we have two questions here. The first two basically are the same question. So for a non-educational developer, developers, so what uh, data is is available through your VPI, especially the data rate? So Hi, Joe. Yeah, can you still hear me? Sorry, I had a little hiccup in my connection. Uh, yes, okay. yes, so yes, we have. Here's the, I will basically say there are a number of different ways to access planet data. And the most critical thing is your affiliation. So if you hold a university affiliation, that is if you're a student, a faculty member, a technical staff member at a university, as long as you've got a, you know, in the US, a .edu email and affiliation or if you're in the UK, of course, you know, it's .ac.uk, but basically if you hold a university credential, I would recommend applying to the education research program because this is where you're gonna get the easiest and the most access, but it still is an application. So you need to tell us a little bit about what you're gonna do. You can't just say, I wanna look at my house. Uh, we usually reject those applications. Um, there are other programs. We do have a developer program and I would encourage you to go to developers.planet.com um, where you can learn more about that. And that is going to be a different uh, amount and kind of terms of use of data. Uh, I would say the university program will give you greater flexibility because what it includes is a publication license. So we, we specifically license you to write scientific papers, present at conferences, you know, go to AGU, et cetera, et cetera. There are also other ways. If you presently are on a NASA funded grant, if you're a PI on a grant, uh, you can access even larger volumes of data that NASA is paying for through a large NASA contract vehicle between Planet and NASA. And then two other programs, uh, we have a relationship with the European Space Agency called the EarthNet program. So Planet Data is one of the third party mission uh, data sources available through ESA, but you've got to apply through ESA. That process takes a little bit longer, but the cool part is um, that's one way to get the high resolution SkySat data, for instance, especially if you don't have the budget to purchase it. Um, at, that all being said, I will say where we've had the greatest flexibility and uptake is in building the relationships directly with universities around these site licenses. So I mentioned there's several UC schools that either hold a departmental or a campus agreement. 
Once that is in place and the cost is, is rather modest, it's comparable to an ESRI site license. In principle, then anyone on your campus with your campus affiliation can access Planet data directly and at a very high volume. Um, and so that's the kind of license you would need if you wanted to do a project, say, over all of the state of California or a project over um, all temperate forests in North America, right? Um, that kind of scale of project and high volume of data, we'd wanna talk about possibly a site license for the university. And we'd love to hear from you on that. Okay, so we have the next question. So are there any plugins for QDS or web maps? There is, yeah, I saw Scott's question there. Um, I, uh, I know we, so we do have an ArcGIS plugin right now. I believe we also have a QGIS plugin. I don't have the notes in front of me, Scott, I apologize. Um, but I would, I would certainly just search for Planet and ArcGIS and I think you'll find a blog post about recent ArcGIS plugin details for, for Planet data. Um, we're also working on, and we're getting down, we're getting to the point where it's, it's becoming a little bit easier. Um, I think our, Earth, our Google Earth Engine integration is getting quite a bit better. So uh, if you have an Earth Engine account and you also have a Planet account, you would still need the Planet account. Um, moving data to Earth Engine is gradually becoming easier. It's still not, it's not quite as easy, I think, as we would like, but it, uh, it's easier than it was about a year ago. Okay. Any other? Questions? I can answer Alex's question really quick, and then I can and then I can pass the yes, mic. Yes. Urban area, yes. I mean, here's here's what I'd say, Alec. Um, Three point seven meter spatial resolution is, uh, you know, around five times sharper than Sentinel two, and about sixty five times sharper than Landsat. So, if your interest is primarily in improved granularity in urban land use land cover or suburban land use land cover, I would say that planet data will give you some improvement and, and probably significant improvement, but I want to set expectations. 3.7 meter, you do not resolve individual vehicles except under extremely optimistic conditions like a very sunny day on a highway where the cars are moving very fast. Okay, and you certainly don't see people. Um, that is where you get more into the very high resolution space and you'd want to be talking about a, a SkySat a SkySat data, and in that case, at a at a commercial cost. Okay, okay. Thank you for for answering the question, Drew. So, uh, our next speaker is Elia, uh, or Elia. I'm oh, sorry if I pronounced the wrong name. Uh, so he got a PhD from University of Pe uh, Padua, Italy, and now he's a postdoc at UC Riverside. And he will talk about the soil, crop, and water interactions. So let's welcome Elia. Hey, thanks. Let me. Um... Let me share my screen real quick. Um, okay. Okay. I'm good to go over here. So thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to um, be uh, here today and uh, talk to you about some of the uh, research that uh, uh, my lab is doing on uh, uh, characterizing spatial and temporal um, patterns and changes in uh, this uh, relationships between soil crops and environment. So as I said, I'm a faculty at the uh, um, Environmental Sciences Department at UC Riverside and uh, uh, I also have a, an affiliation with the um, uh, USDA ARS US Salinity Laboratory, which is one of the national labs for uh, the United States uh, Department for Agriculture. Uh, and we particularly deal with uh, uh, agriculture, uh, agricultural systems that are under uh, water scarcity and uh, salt affected uh, uh, environments. Um, so uh, in particular, my group um, called the Digital Agronomy Lab, uh, we, um, uh, look at the, the use of uh, uh, geospatial measurements, uh, either from proximal and uh, uh, remote sensing, uh, both of soil and plants. And uh, we try to use um, uh, geospatial analysis basically to uh, try to characterize the relationship between soil, plant, uh, and environment. And uh, in specific, we are interested in uh, identifying the effects of uh, abiotic stressors, such as water stress or uh, salinity stress, uh, 
and other abiotic stressors that are typically found in the um, uh, agriculture in uh, uh, semi-arid environments such as California. Um, basically, what we look at is uh, once we characterize these, uh, uh, these spatial temporal relationships, we uh, see how this can be managed through uh, precision uh, management. Uh, in specific, we look at uh, um, the precision uh, management of uh, water resources. Or uh, we um, uh, look at uh, very broad scale, regional scale, um, state scale, um, uh, patterns of, uh, of these uh, uh, factors that are uh, influencing agriculture. In, uh, in a specific, we, we focus a lot on the mapping and monitoring uh, agricultural soil salinity. And our pipeline in general goes always that. Uh, we go from field measurements and then we do geospatial measurements at the field scale and we try to integrate them with remote sensing measurements and then we get like a, a, an understanding of the processes, um, trying to understand the, the, the mechanistic uh, uh, nature of it, but at the same time recognizing the, uh, that there's a lot of random effects that, uh, that have a spatial component as well. Um, so in general, what we do as uh, agronomists, we are trying to see how we can uh, um, maximize the, the, the agricultural production. And if we look at it at the global scale, uh, we can notice that uh, we are growing uh, uh, very well in, uh, as agricultural systems in, uh, in portions of the, of the United States, uh, Northern Europe, uh, somewhere in uh, East, uh, East, uh, uh, East Asia. Uh, but there are several areas um, where we are not doing, uh, doing as well. So like uh, given a specific uh, uh, crop, um, we never produce the 100% of the, the potential of this crop and we, uh, we are limited uh, by several factors. And this very great paper from uh, 2012 by Muller et al. Uh, in Nature argued that most of these uh, um, gaps can be um, closed by uh, improving our management of these cropping systems, in specific by uh, improving the water and nutrient management, so fertilizing and, and irrigation. So, uh, but even when you look at uh, areas where we produce very well, though, uh, you could see that there is a lot of uh, um, uh, across uh, field uh, spatial variability. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the case when a farmer has one field with, with like, let's say, maize or uh, 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 corn, um, and they grow to uh, like very high yield. And uh, their neighboring farmers, because they use different management types, uh, uh, they grow, they don't grow as well. And you can see that uh, the darker the green here, the larger the, this between field uh, variability. But at the same time, if you zoom even more, and I'm, I'm sorry I lost the, 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 the reference for these uh, two uh, figures. I can, uh, if you contact me later on, I can, I can find out the, the reference for you. Um, but it, this comes from the, the um, Lobel uh, Laboratory in, in Stanford. Um, so you can zoom in even, even uh, uh, closer and see what are the uh, differences of yield within a single field. And you can notice that the darker the blue here, you have a lot of uh, variability within a single field. So uh, the growers typically manage homogeneously across uh, an agricultural field and you have areas of this field that produce very well and areas that, that, that are that produce very poorly. And this degree of within field variability changes across uh, across the landscape very much. So uh, what we do uh, here is to uh, try to understand what are the reasons of these, uh, uh, of these uh, 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 changes across different scales. And in, in agronomy, we always look at, uh, uh, at the yield output as a function of uh, genetics. Uh, so like the breed of uh, crop that you're using, environmental factors and management factors. But lately in the past few years, we are making more and more explicit that in, uh, in this function, we need to add the effect of space and time. And this is because most of the uh, uh, factors that are within these uh, genetic environmental management factors, uh, those are uh, uh, characterized by uh, spatial and temporal uh, uh, components. So the soil changes, uh, uh, size of spatial variability across uh, space and time, and uh, same for the water availability and weather. Uh, and the same goes for the management. That can be uh, uh, the, the time you do it, uh, the time you irrigate as, uh, is very important and as well, uh, you know, uh, any other of, uh, management that you can have in there. So this is all to, uh, with the idea of increasing the, um, the output, the yield output of, of the system. But of course, agriculture is not a system that operates in the vacuum. And 
uh, any uh, changes on this relationship has uh, uh, effects at different scales on the environmental sustainability of agriculture and the social sustainability. And this also, as I said, uh, happen at multiple scale from like pond source uh, contamination, over apply uh, an agrochemical uh, to the, uh, the global scale where you have like the uh, climate change effects uh, due to, to agriculture. So this is a very comp complex picture, of course, and uh, uh, one cannot do everything. So <laughs> what we really focus on uh, on my lab is the, to see how uh, soil, uh, water, and uh, weather have uh, uh, and their variability uh, influence the, the output as, 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 uh, as yield and trying therefore to uh, sustain yield quantities while uh, uh, minimizing the environmental footprint of uh, agriculture management. So when you look at the spatial variability within a single field, uh, you would uh, data show uh, from uh, the last uh, 20 years or so of, uh, of, of science in, in agronomy that uh, soil spatial variability is the main driver of within field spatial variability. And this is very apparent in this uh, example here where we have uh, uh, rain fed uh, winter wheat in uh, Colorado. And uh, here we uh, looked at a season where we didn't have much rain. Therefore, the spatial variability of soil and its ability to retain water uh, during the growing season is the main driver of the pretty much like nearly all the ver spatial variability of crop yield at the site. Um, the results also shows that if you would look at this site over different years and uh, over drought and, uh, and a wet year, you would see that uh, you have half of the, the, the variability in this data stack that comes from year-to-year uh, -year variation. And these year-to-year -year variations are normally due to the interaction of weather uh, and uh, soil and, and plant interaction. So this is a good moment to, 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 to talk about how we can um, best uh, address this uh, spatial and temporal variability. And that's with the precision agriculture for ours that uh, entail that you manage your crops at the right time with the right, uh, in the right place, using the right input and in the right amount. And the, uh, uh, what uh, is, can be mostly impactful here in the Southwest where we have water scarce environment is uh, the concept of variable rate irrigation, which refers to the application of different volume or rates of water uh, in different areas of a field. And we call these areas that uh, management zones with the idea that uh, zones are homogeneous within a single unit, but they, uh, they are remarkably different across different units. So the, one of the challenges here is to best delineate these uh, 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 management zones so that you capture most of the variability, but at the same time, you describe areas that are uh, fairly uh, similar uh, among themselves so that they can be uh, under the same management. And when you do this correctly, it, the, the outcomes are very clear because you can increase the yields and also improve the water use efficiency or said in another um, uh, way, you can uh, uh, grow more crop uh, for less drop. So it basically you save water and you sustain yields. Uh, so moving on, uh, some of the research that we do in this uh, uh, field, uh, and here is some research that was done by Mireia Fontaneta, a student from uh, Polytechnic University of Catalonia that uh, visited uh, my lab uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, we used a time series of uh, um, Sentinel data and uh, uh, we looked at the spatial temporal variability of a core growth in a um, field in Catalonia. And we, here we had this uh, Sentinel data. Uh, we clustered the data, uh, especially any time that uh, this would uh, be available, creating different management zones across the year. And then we integrated this type of data with uh, uh, in situ soil moisture sensor data. That gives us an idea of how much water is available in average in each of these uh, management zones. And the cool thing about uh, using this uh, spatial data is that you can use uh, anytime data is available, uh, you can use uh, cluster validity functions to uh, understand what the total within zone uh, variance is for uh, the different variables that you're looking at. And then you can say, so if, uh, uh, um, if with the one you have uh, um, very heterogeneous zones and with zero you have perfectly homogeneous zones, uh, you can, uh, have a, an idea on how well you are de uh, delineated you know, the different zones in your field and perhaps have a target uh, variance uh, uh, level where you want to start uh, your, your uh, precision irrigation practices uh, versus the homogeneous irrigation practices. 
So the output uh, that Mireya had for the growers in this case, it was that she can provide a table in real time uh, for each of the zones that she identifies at different growing stages of, this, uh, uh, of the crop at the site and tell them hey, if this is uh, what you measure uh, as in terms of soil water in the soil profile, you can start irrigating when the soil is this dry and uh, according to how dry it is, you apply this much water. And if you do this, uh, because we can model crop growth with the crop growth models, you should expect at the end of the season to have the best crop, uh, uh, um, the best yield available for, 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 for this type of soil and this type of uh, um, uh, weather conditions that you have. So do this, uh, uh, however, we need a lot of information. We need to know the phenology of the crop. So what type of crop, uh, if it's stressed, what type of growing phase we have and, and such. We need to know about the soil water content. Uh, we need to know what the, how much water the crop uh, needs uh, and is using. We need to know information about the soil spatial variability and uh, perhaps uh, as well information about other type of stressors. But once we do have this information, we really can uh, uh, understand soil wa and water, uh, soil water sol uh, content and solutes content, so like an, an, a nutrients and, uh, and, uh, and salinity. And as well, we can uh, model uh, crop growth and as well predict what uh, should be the expected yield of the site. And then as well, we can, uh, uh, once we have this information, we can provide real time information to the grower on how much they are supposed to irrigate their, uh, uh, their uh, sites on the uh, uh, specific time and specific spa spa space during the growing season. Obviously, uh, having all these uh, uh, like very expensive information is very hard across very large areas. Therefore, what we are trying to do now is to uh, try to integrate networks of available measurements uh, and uh, um, uh, high resolution satellite imagery to uh, uh, and machine learning methods to try to uh, estimate all this inf uh, information in order to be able to um, get this type of uh, prescription for water use to, to growers across very broad areas. And this is, uh, was recently funded by uh, a project uh, from uh, NIFA under the Sustainable Agricultural System Grants that I'm uh, the lead uh, PI for, and it's led by University of California Riverside, and, uh, but there's uh, quite a few other people involved in this as well. And the idea here is that uh, we are going to look at the US Southwest uh, which is very important for agriculture in the US, uh, um, hires a lot of people and generates a lot of uh, our revenue. But as well, we have uh, prolonged droughts, uh, competition for water use between city, um, uh, energy production, uh, agriculture indeed. And uh, we are different uh, under different climate pressure, climate change, and, uh, and as well, uh, uh, uncertain weather patterns. Uh, and we are experiencing uh, degradation of water and soil from uh, excessive uh, salt and chemicals that are in the systems. Uh, and then you find all these normally like either in the south of California here in the Salton Sea or like in the Gulf or in the coastal areas. And as well, we have uh, uh, increasing pressure from uh, weeds, pathogens and, and insects. So the idea here is that if we have the, the availability of daily high resolution, uh, remote sensing and uh, availability of a uh, ground measurement from uh, a dense network uh, that is uh, spatially distributed across the entire region. We can train artificial intelligence to try monitor uh, what's going on in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, soil, water, and agricultural uh, input uh, uh, status and presence of pests. And then if this, this actually works, then it can be used as an input for a decision support framework. Um, that can then lay the foundations for long-term changes in the, in the entire way that we think about agriculture in the Southwest and perhaps uh, justify the shift to precision uh, agriculture across the entire uh, US Southwest. So what we're doing here in brief, um, we are uh, getting data from uh, uh, public, uh, publicly available satellite and other geospatial data. We, are, uh, we got one of those campus licenses that uh, 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 Joe was talking about. Uh, and as well, we are partnering with uh, Agit Ag Tech industry members to uh, gain access to their um, data networks that they that they have on uh, across the, the the U.S. Southwest, and as well we collaborate with growers. And the idea is here to uh, integrate ground measurements with this uh, high resolution remote sensing data, go through the uh, machine learning and, and AI uh, black box, and then uh, refine all the uh, perhaps already available tools for broader. Uh, uh, scale uh, broader resolution remote sensing 
or develop new ones that can tell us what type of crop we have in the place, what growing stage we're at, uh, refine available soil maps, uh, including soil moisture and soil salinity, understand what the water requirement is for a crop, and then uh, uh, all the other information that is used uh, is needed to create a daily high resolution soil water balance so that you know for the entire root zone how much water you need to uh, add, how much uh, nutrients you need to add to expect optimal growth. And then uh, once you have this type of information, you can balance uh, 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 the trade-offs between having optimal growth and, uh, and, uh, and reducing the environmental impacts of, uh, of uh, uh, agronomic practices. And this can be used by the farmer at the very local scale to understand how much water they need to apply or at the regional scale to uh, help out uh, uh, natural resource managers. And there's an, another part of um, pest detection that is uh, like a much smaller part on the reserves there where we're gonna use uh, drone images and uh, sky sets or the very high resolution data from planet to try to do some uh, classification of uh, abiotic uh, stress. Um, but yeah, to conclude though, so what we are doing is to try to uh, gain knowledge on uh, soil plant and water relationships so that we can uh, tailor management uh, uh, and increase the sustainability of agriculture. We realized though that there's a very uh, remarkable variability across different spatial and temporal scales. And I think that the, the solution to this should be to integrate uh, the use of data science with a, a network of ground and remote uh, measurements so that we can there increase the economic and environmental sustainability of uh, US agricultural systems. And I think that's all I got for today. Yes, that's it, that's it. So there's a link to, to my lab Twitter and as well to uh, my labs uh, for to see all the, the, the ongoing projects that, that we have. Okay, thanks a lot. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. yes. Uh, for one repetition. I think we passed 12 uh, p.m. Uh, so we have two questions here. I can answer them quickly. So the first one, how do you find management zones and how do you determine soil types either using remote sensing or field measurements? So uh, management zones that can be done through uh, clustering algorithms. Uh, if you guys are familiar with the uh, RGIS, for example, there's a, a fuzzy K uh, clustering that is done uh, under the tool of grouping analysis. Uh, but we use uh, any other um, uh, fuzzy clustering, so unsupervised clustering algorithms. So you just input the data that you have, the geospatial data that you have, either from a soil sensor or from a remote sensing data. And you would find uh, areas that are uh, like uh, the, the algorithm would just uh, output uh, areas that are fairly similar among themselves and uh, uh, different enough from uh, neighboring areas. And to improve the soil maps, we have a, like a multiple scale type of, of approach where we look at uh, um, uh, measurements done on the field scale with the uh, hard soil sampling and then uh, sensors that we use at the, at the, at the field site. We calibrate the sensor at the field site so that we can get more information from the ground troop. And then once we have enough information on the ground, we use remote sensing data and temporal uh, time series uh, type of uh, analysis to um, uh, understand what the spatial variability of the underlying soil properties are. Mm -hmm. So it's a multi-step uh, with data fusion from ground. Cool. So we have another one. So highly merchandised agriculture will likely to take jobs away. So how, how would you like, how do you, how do you address this? <laughs> uh, well, the, the point is that, well, the, uh, I, I, I'm not going uh, too much into that, but they, they, the, the uh, several uh, groups uh, of like uh, growers as well have done uh, this type of analysis and it, it will definitely create uh, higher skilled jobs where you need to go and manage the systems that are doing the hard and, uh, and, uh, and dangerous work of like, you know, laying down pipes that's not done anymore. Uh, and perhaps even harvesting by hand is not done anymore. But you need a lot of people that will need to go and, uh, and make sure that these systems work, that the sensors work, the, the, the machinery works and all that. So there's gonna be a, a shift on the industry a little bit, I, I think. But it's not, uh, I don't think that we're going to see like uh, uh, a lot less uh, workers uh, that are going to, uh, to be uh, employed in, in the industry. Uh, the other thing is that like if you want to, I'm not too much of an expert on the, on the economy of, uh, of the workforce. But one of the problems that we are experiencing uh, in California that I've, that I've read about is that having 
uh, uh, more and more people in us uh, and like, uh, Mexico and uh, Central America that are getting more and more access to education makes it so that they find much better paid jobs uh, in their own countries that then uh, they prevents them from coming here and getting very low paid jobs in agriculture as uh, fruit pickers. So there's a uh, there's that gap of, uh, of employment that, that, that might need be needed to look at and therefore it's better to perhaps create uh, uh, jobs that are highly like well better paid in, in agriculture as, uh, as uh, to support like these uh, precision agricultural systems. Yeah, but that's not really my field and I suggest that uh, uh, to do your own uh, research and perhaps contact uh, many of the excellent economists that we have uh, uh, within the, the UC systems that are looking at these problems. Thank you for answering the questions, Ilya. So let's give another big round of applause to our speakers. So our session ends, but we invite you to continue the conversation in our Slack channel. Uh, I think Jillian posted the Slack channel before and also follow us on Twitter. And uh, thank you again. And thank you for everyone attending this session. So the following is maybe hour, so you can join and have a, have a carol, a conversation with the uh, GIS folks. So uh, let's see. Thank you all.